Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. at Shoreline, uh, we're in the, kind of the stream of this journey through the book of Acts, and we've been looking at Acts and the Holy Spirits, Acts and the Church, and uh, this right here, this is what's called a commentary. This entire book is just on the book of Acts, and it breaks down every verse, every word, the background, the historical context, and you say, why would you tell us that? Um, I probably have over 500 commentaries on the 66 books of the Bibles, and I, in any given series, I can use three to 10 different books to learn and get background in history. Of all the commentaries I've ever read on any book of the Bible, this is the absolute best. By a guy named Jeeth Fernando, who I've got to know personally, he's one of the most brilliant. He's kind of like Mother Teresa, but he's a man. He lives in Sri Lanka. He has laid his life down for Jesus like nobody I've ever met in my life. And he wrote, he's also a brilliant scholar. So we, we bought 15 copies of this. Uh, there it's 40 or $50 or something. I think we got them for 25. We got them for our cost. We get them half off. We have 15 of them in the lobby. If you want to go deeper in the book of Acts, I challenge you to buy one of these. If we run out, we'll get some more. But uh, because of our relationship with Zonderman, we get them half off. So uh, just, if you're loving the study of the book of Acts and you want to dig in, that's for you out there in the lobby, and you can get that after the service. Uh, I grew up on the other side of the fence uh, in terms of church world, in terms, in terms of the church. And so uh, if this is the fence, I grew up on the outside of church world. I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't go to Sunday school. I didn't hear Bible stories. I wasn't taught to pray at home. Um, I didn't know Christmas and Easter were religious holidays. I lived over in this world. And on the other side of this fence, there's this whole world. I'm where I grew up in kind of Newport Beach, Huntington Beach area. There were plenty of churches. I just had never been in one. I didn't know what the people did inside the church. I was it's kind of some other world. And I didn't even, honestly, I didn't spend much time like trying to peek in and see what was going on on the other side there. I didn't, I didn't really care. It wasn't, part, it wasn't part of my world. It wasn't part of my life. But, but, I, but I've learned as a follower of Jesus that there's lots of different worlds and there's kind of barriers, dividers, fences between different worlds. And the story we're going to look at today in, in Acts chapter 10, and if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open to Acts chapter 10 and keep your Bible open in front of you. We're going to walk through a big portion of this. We're going to kind of walk through the story. If you don't have a Bible with you, we'll have some of the passages up on the screen. A lot of it will just be kind of telling and reading the story to you. But this is a story in Acts chapter 10 about somebody who lived on the outside, somebody on this side of the fence, the outside side of the fence a guy named Cornelius. And though Cornelius was, was sort of religiously curious, was doing some religious things, he wasn't uh, Jewish by culture, he was, he was Roman, and he wasn't a Christian by faith, he was a spiritual kind of a God-fearer trying to figure out the God thing. So we're going to learn about Cornelius, who was sort of on the outside of the story, and we're going to learn about Peter, who was absolutely deep on the inside. He was Jewish by heritage, he knew his faith. He'd become a follower of Jesus Christ. And so as a Jewish person who was awaiting the coming Messiah, he believed and came to know that Jesus Christ was that Messiah who entered human history and became the Savior and the one who washes away our sins. And Peter was on the inside of all of this. Now to us, that may not seem like a big deal, but it was a big deal in the first century. If you were a Jewish person in the first century, you saw all of the world and every human being divided into two groups. On this side of the fence... There were those who were Jewish. They were on the inside. They were, they were God's people. And on this side of the fence was everybody else in the human family, and they were called Gentiles, and they were on the outside. And the Jewish people believed that the God of the Bible was the God for them and not for those folks over there. And we're going to see these, these two worlds, we're going to see these two worlds collide in Acts chapter 10. We're going to see God bring together these two people in these two worlds, and we're going to see this divider, this wall that God wants obliterated and gone. We're going to see how God dealt with that in the life of Peter as he encountered Cornelius. So if your Bibles are open to Acts chapter 10, we're going to begin in verse 1. This is scene 1, and in scene 1, I call, I call this a vision, an angel, and a strange request. A vision, an angel, and a strange request. Scene one starts on this side of the fence, the outside portion, the Gentile side, where Cornelius lives in the city of Caesarea. So we begin. 
At Caesarea, there was a man by the na- a man named Cornelius. Now, Caesarea, you have to understand, was a thoroughly Roman town. It was built up by Herod the Great, and and and, and Caesarea had an amphitheater, had a theater, had a man-made harbor, had a giant uh, shrine to the emperor for emperor worship. It was, to the Jewish mind, Caesarea was utterly pagan and godless. And that's where, that's where Cornelius lives, and that's where we meet him, all right? At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. He was a centurion. He was a military guy. Had a, he was a leader in the military because he had 100 soldiers under his guidance. He was a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family, now listen to this, were devout and God-fearing. They believed in a God. They were trying to figure out the whole God thing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Those were two of the three pillars of the Jewish faith. Generosity, so he he gave uh, regularly, and he also prayed to God. And so he gave, the third third pillar was, was fasting, and that's not mentioned here. One day, at about three in the afternoon, which was one of the one of the times, set times of prayer on a daily basis, One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision, and he distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, and Cornelius responded just like you and I would have responded. Cornelius stared at him in fear. This is not a normal happening. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. His staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants, and he told them everything that had happened. He told them the whole story, and he sent them to Joppa. So, end scene one. So here's Cornelius. He sees this angel, and he's told to send to a town 30 miles away And get a guy named Peter, who didn't just live 30 miles away, he lived a world away. Because he was Jewish, and he was a leader in the church. And Cornelius was not. And he's asked to get this guy and ask him, he said, now you send people out into Peter's world, and get Peter, and have him come back into Cornelius' world. It's a unique happening here. Here's lesson one, as I look at this passage. God shows up, God speaks, and God leads when we're seeking. And it doesn't matter where you are on the journey. Here's Cornelius. He's a God-fearer. He's a spiritual seeker. But he's not actually fully Jewish, and he's not a Christian, but he's curious. He's hungry. He's asking. He wants to know more. And so here he is, and he's seeking after God. And guess what? God shows up. Do you believe that God shows up even to non-believers if their hearts are open and they're seeking? Anybody believe that? Yes. Yeah. I can tell you a story of my friend Nabil Qureshi, who's with Jesus now. Many of you know Nabil. Nabil was a devout Muslim. And, and was, his grandfather was a Muslim apologist who defended the Muslim faith. And he was really, and Nabil did a great job as a devout Muslim of breaking up some people's faith. But he, he ran into a young guy named David who was a committed Christian. But he also began to seek and say, God, if you're more, he, he wrote a book called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. And, and Nabil began to seek, God, if, if I don't have it right, show me. And God, through dreams and visions, showed up to Nabil. He went on to write books and have a huge impact, preach in our church many, many times, and now he's with Jesus. But you know what? When you seek after God, God is ready to respond. But not just for spiritual seekers who don't know Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you know him, when you seek God, he is ready to respond. If you're a follower of Jesus, do you understand that you don't yet fully know Jesus all the way? Do you understand that? There's more of Jesus for you to know. Well, I've been a Christian for 60 years. There's more, just believe me, there is more of Jesus for you to know. And when you seek him, when you cry out to him, he is ready to respond and draw you to himself. God is waiting for people who will seek him. Scene two. I call scene two a vision, a refusal, and a new way of thinking. And now we're going to go on this side of the partition to Peter's world, to the Jewish world. And and, and we see that he has a vision. But then there's an interesting refusal. Pay attention as we begin in verse 9. So so now, it's the next day. At noon the following day, as they were on their journey, that means the people Cornelius has sent are now traveling the 30 miles, and they're going to Joppa, right? As they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. 
And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Peter saw heaven. He's in this trance. He has this vision. Peter saw heaven open as something like a large sheet or a gigantic net being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I envision, in this vision, I envision like, like a net the size of this room. I mean, massive, like this thing. And it's filled with four-legged animals, animals that walk the earth. It's filled with reptiles. It's filled with fish. Some of them are clean animals. Some of them are unclean animals in the Jewish world of what they could eat and couldn't eat. And so, and so Peter, you know, God says in this vision, he says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's response is very interesting. You'll see up on the screen here. He says, surely not, Lord. When you say, Lord, you're saying, you're my master, you're my Lord, you're in charge. He's saying, no boss, no Lord. He says, surely not, Lord, which is an interesting thing to say. Peter replied, I have never eaten anything that is impure or unclean. As a Jewish person, there was a dividing line about what he could eat. And for the Jewish people, there were certain foods you could eat and not eat, and a certain way foods had to be prepared. And this food, this dietary food division was one of the things that kept them from interacting with non-Jewish people. You can have a meal in somebody's home if you don't know if they prepared it the right way or have the right things. They often couldn't buy the food in the markets because they didn't know if the food had been sacrificed in the wrong way. And, and so, so the food and dietary laws became a dividing thing. And on top of that, a Jewish person would never go into the home of a non-Jewish person. They would become unclean. They wouldn't, certainly would not sit at a table and share a meal with an unclean Gentile person. There were all these divisions, and one of these divisions were about food. But what we're going to discover with Peter is God's using food as an illustration, but God's getting at something deeper, a heart issue that's going on in Peter, and I think a heart issue that goes on in all of us at certain times when we're not careful. And, and so in the second scene, you know, God says to him, the vo- surely not, Lord, Peter replied, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. Verse 15 says this, the voice spoke to him a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. So Peter's saying, well, we, got, we have our rules and regulations. I can't eat this. And God says, but wait, listen to me. What I say is going to overcome your rules and regulations. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. In the ancient world, when something happened three times, it was repeated three times, that was like maximum emphasis. This is a big deal. This is a big moment in the life of the church. Here's lesson number two. Be careful when you think you have God nailed down and figured out. Be careful when you think you have it all figured out. Now, let me be clear. The Bible is true from beginning to end, and we never compromise on this. But we oftentimes take things and add them on top of the Bible, and we put in our own understanding of things. And what we often do is we, we create divisions that God says, I'm here to tear down divisions, and we're about building divisions up oftentimes, whether we mean to or not. So we can't assume that God sees the world just the way we do. We oftentimes, even, even those of us who have come to the cross and received Jesus Christ, will say things like this. I'll say, I know that God loves sinners. I know that God loves sinners. But you know what we mean? God loves sinners like me on my side of the fence here. But I'm not sure if God loves sinners like them way over there deep in the recesses and corners of the other side of the fence. We say, I know God's for everyone, but I'm not sure if God's really for you. I know I want everyone to come to our church, but I'm not sure if I want you to come to our church. We're getting a picture of the church that's as big as the heart of God. And so we have to see things and understand things the way that God does. That's the end of scene number two. Scene three, worlds collide. I call this a bold request and an invitation in. What happens now is Cornelius' world and Peter's world come together, and things get very, very interesting. Look with me at verse 17. So watch the timing of this. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, so Peter has literally just had this vision. He's sitting on the roof. He's in Joppa. He's wondering, what does this vision mean? This big giant net, animals and fish and reptiles and rise, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord. But, but, don't, but then God says, but don't call anything unclean that I've called clean. And he's, and he's sorting through this in his mind. During that very moment, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon Peter's house was and stopped at the gate. At the moment that Peter is sitting on the roof, And thinking, what does this mean? At that very moment, the delegation sent by Cornelius has walked up, and you have to notice this. It says, they stopped at the gate. Why? Because they would not walk across that gate line and step onto the property of that household. Why? Because that's Jewish territory. And they knew, you you just don't do that. That's offensive. They knew, they knew, they, they were in this 
culture where these two groups existed, sort of kind of coexisted, but they weren't really intermingling. And so they stopped right at the gate. And they start yelling for Peter because they would not walk in. They knew the rules. They knew that there was not just a physical gate there. There was a spiritual gate. Because for the Jewish people, to even encounter and to connect with in an intimate way with a Gentile person would make them unclean and spiritually dirty. That's the division. We, we can't comprehend how significant this was in the ancient world. We're like, oh, people are people. What's the big deal? No, that's not how it worked back then. But, but Peter had grown up in that world. He lived in that world. And there were things that were still keeping him separate from other people. And so, they come, they find the house, they stop at the gate. So here they are standing there, and verse, verse 18, they called out asking if Simon, was, who was known as Peter, is staying there. Hey, is there a guy named Simon Peter staying here? They don't walk in, they stand there at the gate. While Peter is still thinking about the vision, so he's pondering the vision, the Spirit told him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so go get up, Go downstairs, do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. God says, Peter, you're going to leave your world, and you're going to walk with them into their world. There's sort of this little you know, crack in the division. There's this little, the gate's kind of opening, the wall's kind of breaking down a little bit. And, and, and God says, Peter, you're going to go with them. And so, so Peter now has to respond to this. Verse 21, Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? Peter doesn't know what's going on. Peter doesn't understand what God is doing, that God is going to take this wall, this division that's still in his heart and that's still among many of the early Christians when it came to the rest of the world. See, they kind of thought Jesus was just for them, just for Jewish people who had come to know Jesus was the Messiah. They didn't really know Jesus was for other people. And God's doing something deeper, but Peter doesn't know what it is. Why have you come, he asks. So the men who've come from Cornelius replied, we've come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who's respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter, and listen, don't, don't just let this go by you easily. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. Peter says, listen to you guys, come, you know. He opened the door, cracked one, come on in. Be our guests. Unheard of in the ancient world. For a Jewish person to say to Gentiles, come into this home. But, but God's doing something in Peter. This normal human resistance and divisions, God is slowly chipping away. God is slowly breaking those down. Lesson number three. God loves to tear down barriers. God loves tearing down barriers between people, barriers of bitterness, barriers of fear, barriers of, of anything, whether, it, it, whether it's an economic barrier, a racial barrier, a political barrier, a, a, you know, a financial barrier, a life history barrier, a, a, a whatever it is. You name the barrier, God loves to tear those down. And we live with those, and oftentimes we don't even notice or see those things. And, and, and so, so God loves to tear down barriers. And here's the amazing thing. Peter has walked with Jesus for three years. Peter's one of the 12 apostles. He's got like this up-close view of Jesus for three years, and he's watched Jesus break barriers all over the place, but he still hasn't got it. Have you ever thought to yourself, you know, gosh, if I could have just been in the ancient world, if I could have just walked with Jesus, my faith would be so strong. I mean, if I could have just walked with Jesus, I thought that if I could have just been there to see what he did, I'd be so strong. And yet here's Peter, one of his closest followers, and Peter still doesn't get it. He still hasn't understood that, that when Jesus walked on this earth, back in Jesus' day, there was one side of culture of healthy people, and then there was a whole class of people called lepers, people who had leprosy. If you had leprosy, you were on the other side of the fence in a big way. You could not relate in the real world. You could, you could not interact with people. If you had leprosy in the ancient world, and you were walking in any public context, and you saw anybody walking near you who wasn't leprous, you would have to scream one word, unclean, unclean. And everyone would be just like, part the Red Sea. They would get away from you. Everybody stayed away from people with leprosy. They were on the other side of the fence culturally. But what did Jesus do when he saw people with leprosy? He said, come here. And when he healed them, remember what he did when he did when he healed them? He touched them. He didn't do that. But Jesus was breaking down barriers. And Peter watched that, but he still didn't get it. 
In the ancient world, women were on the other side of the fence. I'm going to talk about this in our next night of worship, um, the first, uh, first uh, Wednesday of next month, about the, the cultural, uh, how men and women function in, in the first century world. But women in the first century were completely separate from men. In their homes, they had separate quarters. In public, men didn't talk with women in public. You can't even comprehend. There's, there's some places in the world today where women still are not allowed to speak outside in public settings. But that was the world of Jesus' day. And you read John chapter 4, when Jesus meets the, the Samaritan woman at the well, he talks with her about spiritual things. No rabbi in Jesus' day would have had a theological, spiritual conversation with a woman in any setting, much less publicly. And Jesus just knocked the wall down. And Peter saw that. And he still didn't get it. Peter got this close-up view of Jesus breaking down walls because that's the heart of God. But somehow Peter had missed the key message. End of scene three. Scene four. I should not be here, but God is changing me. That's Peter. Peter says, I shouldn't be here. I don't belong here, but God's doing something. God is changing me. Look at verse 28, the second half of, I'm sorry, the second half of verse 23. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived at Caesarea. So now Peter is leaving Joppa. He's going to Caesarea. He's going to this Roman kind of center of, 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 of commerce and activity. And so he travels to get there. He gets there. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and called together his relatives and close friends. So Cornelius gets all of his family, all of his close friends. He wants them to hear what Peter has to say because he knows there's going to be a life-changing message. All right? So they're all gathered together. Verse 25. Peter entered the house. Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. He said, I don't deserve that kind of respect. I'm just another person. Now watch this. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware. Now listen to this. He's very clear. You are well aware that is against our law for a Jew to associate or visit a Gentile, any non-Jew. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? So now Peter gathers with these people now, and he entered, now he's, some of the walls are being broken down, not knocked over, but kind of opened up a little bit. And Peter walks into the home of, of, of Cornelius, where he is, and he walks in, and there's all this family and all these friends. And how does Peter begin his conversation? He says, you all know I'm not supposed to be here. We don't relate with people. There, there, there is a wall between us, and you all know I don't belong here. I shouldn't be here. But here's what Peter says. But something's happened in me. I've learned something I didn't understand before. And it's very interesting how Peter responds because, because he says this. He says, you know that, that we're not, you're aware that we, should, uh, you know, we don't spend time with Jews, don't associate with Gentiles, but God has shown me, verse six, God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Now, if, if you look back and you remember the story, when Peter's up on the roof of the house and he has this vision and, and, and God gives him this vision and this giant net comes down with all these animals in it and some are clean and some are unclean and he knew all the rules and regulations and God says, Peter, rise, kill, eat. No, Lord, I won't do it. And God says, don't call anything impure or unclean. But here's what Peter's discovered, at least in this time as he's traveling over to Caesarea and God's speaking to his heart. The, the divider that Peter's dealing with is not just about dietary regulations, what you eat and don't eat. God is talking about human beings, about people. And so Peter now says, this is what God has taught me. God has shown me that I should not call anyone, any person, impure or unclean. And then you look at, in verse 30, Cornelius answered, and he tells the story. Three days ago, I was in my house, it was three in the afternoon, and he tells the whole story. So I sent for you immediately, Cornelius says, and it was good of you to come. Now we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. So now, here's Cornelius and all his family and all his friends, and this is what they're doing. <laughs> and it's what Peter's doing.
They're, they're saying, you have something to tell us. You have a message for us. And, and Peter still doesn't fully know what it is. He doesn't fully understand. But, but, but there's a moment. See, in all, the, all this time traveling with Jesus and watching Jesus tear down barriers, Peter's still in his heart of hearts. He believes that Jesus is for him and his kind. And not for them. So here, here stands all of these people that are hungry for the message. They're waiting for the message of the good news of Jesus. That's the message Peter's supposed to bring. And Peter it still hasn't fully sunk in. Lesson number four. Divine calling always trumps tradition, cultural norms, and personal fears. The divine call of God should overcome our traditions, our norms, our fears. For Peter, there's still this wall. There's still, there's still the foods we can eat and can't eat. There's still the religious divisions. There's still all these divisions. And so even though he's there and he's cracked the door open a little bit, his own personal fears, his own personal traditions, his own understanding is standing in the way. He has not yet fully understood the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He walked with Jesus for three years. Years. He watched Jesus die on the cross. He watched him rise again. He shared a meal with Jesus after he rose. He heard Jesus say, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He heard the risen Jesus Christ say, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Take my message and go to the whole world. And here's this group of people standing there saying, we're ready. Tell us what we need to hear. And Peter's like, I'm not sure what to say. Because these walls are so high and so tough to get through. But then we come to scene five. God breaks down walls, loves all people, and calls us to do the same. God breaks down the walls. God loves people that we can't imagine are truly lovable in the heart of God. Verse 34, scene five. Then Peter began to speak. Now watch this. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. He finally gets it. You know, here, Peter, Peter you know, the, the people, are, here's Cornelius, people are saying, we're ready. Tell us, God has called you through a vision. God has brought you here. You've broken through your barriers. You've come into our home. So tell us what's on your heart to tell us. And Peter's like, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to tell you. And all of a sudden he realizes, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe God loves them too. Maybe God loves them, are you ready for this? As much as he loves me. Maybe even though I've always seen them through a wall or through a fence or through something that kept me separate from that. Maybe God loves them as much as he loves me and maybe God's calling me to love them too. Maybe God's calling us to become family with each other because God tears down walls. God loves all people and call, God calls us to do the same. So Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. He begins to tell the story of Jesus. Oh, I get it. Maybe Jesus is for them. Maybe Jesus loves them. This wall that stood between them made, made Peter, Peter so believe that Jesus was just for them. And so in this moment, in Peter's heart and in Peter's life, it's like, it's like this wall just gets folded and dropped down, and it's just, it's just gone. And now all of a sudden, Peter looks and he sees these people. And they're saying, tell us, tell us what's on your heart. And so Peter realizes now that Jesus is for them. And so, and so he begins to tell the story. He says, you know what happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee and after the baptism that John had preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. And he just tells them the Jesus story. And we are witnesses of everything that Jesus did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. But they killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. And he tells the story of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. And, and then Peter says, and he was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen. And they put himself in that group. By us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He said, I was there. I shared meals with Jesus after he rose. And he commanded us 
to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. He tells them the story of Jesus Christ through his life, through his death, through his resurrection. If you receive this Jesus Christ, you can be saved, you can be cleansed, you can have new life. And Peter tells Gentiles, them, the people on the other side of the fence, because God has broken that wall down finally in Peter's heart. It's broken down. And you know what happens next? The Holy Spirit of God falls on the Gentiles. Watch this. Just like the Spirit fell on the Jewish believers in Acts chapter 2 in Pentecost. We studied that a few weeks ago. The same Holy Spirit, the same God, the same Jesus falls on these people. And, and they realize it's this, it's this the same God loves them. It's not God for us and something else for them. It's God who loves all of us. And so he says, who, what keeps us right now from baptizing? And they have this baptism service. And all of a sudden, Peter, who lived in this one world with this massive wall between him and Cornelius over here, these two people become brothers through faith in Jesus Christ. And the divisions are torn down and the walls are broken down. And that's the heart of God. Lesson number five. The family of God is way bigger than we dream. And let's not ever limit who God can invite into his family. The family of our God is much bigger than we realize. And when the family of God looks small and we think it's just us, we, we are closing our hearts to the heart of Jesus and our minds to the mind of Christ and our lives to the call to break down barriers and to love people and to reach them right where they're at. That's the heart of Jesus. That's the call of Jesus Christ. And that means we as his followers have to search our hearts because we can live with barriers. We can live with divisions. We, we can come into the family of God, be forgiven of our sin and forget where we came from and all that God has done for us. I had a young man who came to move to this community and started coming to visit Shoreline Church and I built a relationship with him. He started visiting Shoreline and he was kind of standoffish about faith, but he was curious. Over a time of being around here as a non-believer, very, very much not living a Christian life, but coming to Shoreline, he felt at home here, he felt welcomed in. And he came to the point where he came to the cross and this message that Peter, the same message that Peter shared with Cornelius and his family, this young man heard the story of Jesus who lived a sinless life, God with us, who died on the cross, who rose again, who broke the power of sin and death and can forgive sins. And this guy gave his heart to Jesus Christ. Yeah. And then, and then, I said to this guy, I really want to challenge you just to get involved in the life of Shoreline. And here's what he said to me. He said, I, I don't think, um, he said, I don't think Shoreline will, uh, it would be good for me to be at Shoreline. He said, I just, and he was kind of cryptic. He said, I don't think it would be good. I, I don't think I'd really be fully welcomed at Shoreline. And I said, what do you mean? He says, he says, you don't know my background. You don't know my past. And I said, I said what, you know, whatever it is, God's forgiven it. That's in the past. He said, no, you don't know my background. You don't know my past. And he went on to say, if you did a Google search of my name, you will find out that I was involved in um, all kinds of hate speech, hate crimes, all kinds of horrible things. And I was a leader in a group that was just so filled with hatred. And he said, and anyone at the church could just do a search and find my, these things about me. And he says, I don't think you want someone like me in your church. What do you say to somebody who's just become part of your family through Jesus Christ, who says, I don't think that it would be good for me to be part of God's family, even though I'm part of God's family now. And I said to him, I said, no. I said, you will be loved. You will be welcomed. And I actually said to him, and he was all new to the whole faith thing, I said, I said, you know about the guy named Saul who became Paul? And we preached about him just recently. And, and I said, in the Bible, he says, no. And I said, well, he, he was a guy who was murdering Christians, killing Christians, destroying churches, and destroying Christian homes. And he became a Christian, and he ended up writing 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. And here's what he said to me. He says, I've got to learn more about that guy. <laughs> so he said, 13 of the books in the Bible were written by a guy who was killing Christians before he became a Christian. Can we be careful to never let anyone feel like they don't belong? And you know what? I came into the church as a non-believer, as this punk surf kid who was so self centered I came to church. The church I went to, I went because there were cute girls and they had like activities going on. I didn't go looking for Jesus. I didn't go with a pure heart. I went with an impure heart. 
But the church that I went to, Garden Grove Community Church, they, they invited me in. They opened the door and they loved me even though I was messed up and hard-hearted. They just loved me right where I was at. That's, that's the church of Jesus Christ. That's the church we have to be. And, and one day, when we're in glory, the picture the Bible gives is that we will gather together from every tongue and every tribe and every nation and every people around the throne of the Lamb of God and glorify him. And until then, oh Lord Jesus, until that day, Jesus, until the day that we gather and see you face to face, may we be a church that, that, that breaks down barriers. May we be people that don't look at other people and quickly judge, that we don't look at other people and quickly exclude people, but that we would understand, oh God, the greatness of your love and, and the amazing grace that saved us. And so God, forgive us when we, God, forgive us when we Look at other people as on the other side of the fence and the other side of the divide. Forgive us when somebody might walk into Shoreline Church and we might feel like, do they belong here? Lord, tear down the walls, tear down the barriers, tear down the divisions. And let us understand that we are called to share your love and grace with anyone and everyone, no matter how far away they may seem. And I want to ask you just to keep your heart in a place of prayer. And if you're able to physically stand, will you stand with me? We're going to respond with a simple chorus, uh, just singing two verses of amazing grace. I want you to remember God's grace for you. I want you to sing of God's grace for you. And I want you to think about those people that need to know the grace of Jesus because the church that God is building is bigger than we dream. From our hearts, let's sing this as a declaration and as a prayer. Jesus, remind us of the greatness of your grace. A grace and a forgiveness and a love that's big enough even for a sinner like me, like us. Remind us that your grace and your love and your forgiveness is big enough for any other kind of sinner. May we be people who live seeking to tear down the divisions that would keep people from knowing your love and your grace. May we be a church that invites people in and says, you can be here, you can come just as you are 
as you're trying to understand this Jesus. Lord, you know we're always going to hold to your word. To, to love people where they are, Lord, is not a compromise. Jesus, that's what you did. So we hold to your word without compromise. And we will love people where they are without fear and invite people in to the life of your church as they're learning what it means to be part of your family through faith. Jesus, let us build homes that tear walls down, a church that tears walls down. Let us be people that tear walls down for the glory and the sake of Jesus.